Well, in the past few episodes, we covered how Yu, through his political maneuvering and his uh, military conquests and achievements, um, set the stage and built the foundations of transitioning the early tribal societies, or rather the later day tribal societies, uh, into a feudal state, into a unified kingdom. And of course, that took a long time. It practically took his entire lifetime to you know, amass enough political capital and build his own power base. And today, in today's story and video, we would see finally how all these tribal leaders and regional chiefs were being dragged, kicking and screaming into a new normal, into to them what would be the new world order for their period of time. So, without much further ado, let's go. Hello and welcome to the show. My name is Apingo and I am the Chain Smoking Writer. Here we share the myths, legends and histories of the Chinese people from the first creator to the last imperial dynasty. More than 6,000 years of stories, one video at a time. And if you'd like to join us on this journey through time, remember to click the subscribe button and the bell icon so you'll be updated whenever a new video drops. And if you'd like to connect with me on Patreon or other social media platforms, the links are available here and down in the description box. So yeah, let's get on with today's story. Now as we mentioned in previous episodes, Yu's authority over the land was greatly enhanced uh, after the casting of his nine giant bronze vessels and his successful campaign against the Miao people. Now in the later days of his reign, the central court had amassed enough uh, military might and political power uh, to crush basically any individual tribal leader uh, that would even dream of going against the wishes of Yu and his court. Now Yu's power and authority was unassailable by this time and he felt that you know it was time to actually further diminish the powers and the autonomy of the regional tribes and the chiefs and to bring them further under the control of the central court, uh, more like a direct rule of the central court. To that end, he decided to call another grand council of the tribes, and um, it was to be held at Mao Shan in today's uh, Zhejiang Shaoxing. Now, the point of the council was a display of power and authority for Yu and the central court, and to further consolidate the power base and his. Uh, and to tighten the control over these tribal chiefs, uh, these regional leaders. Now, the leader of the Fang Feng tribe that resided near the meeting place had always been, you know, reluctant or resistant to the authority and the influence of the central court and, of course, to Yu himself. And he would take every opportunity that arose to show his disre disregard and his disdain of the central court and what he thought about the authority. Now, this occasion was no different, of course, and um, he purposely arrived late to the council and he sauntered leisurely into the meeting tent, you know, with total disregard and disrespect to everyone and, of course, to the king, to Yu himself. I mean, this guy felt that, you know, I'm a regional chief, I am one of the big tribal chiefs of the land, and, you know, I have my own pride, I have my own dignity to uphold, and, you know, you might call yourself king, but what the heck are you going to do to me? What can you do to me? He did not believe that anything will happen to him, you know. But um, this impertinence and this uh, disrespect, this blatant, this respect of Yu's authority greatly infuriated the king. And, you know, to everyone's surprise and most probably most of all to the leader of the Fang Feng tribe, he actually ordered the immediate execution of him on the spot, in front of everyone. And it was carried out. This fellow was beheaded right in the meeting tent in front of all the gathered chiefs. And this display of power um, really worked. It worked as intended. It worked 
beautifully. You know, decades ago, it would have, you know, caused an uprising or a riot or a rebellion, but this time, it worked. And throughout the course of the entire council, the entire meeting, the chiefs willingly gave up much of their autonomy and their power, their, their, their autonomous powers. They, they gave up a lot of these powers to the central court and submitted to a more direct form of control, a more direct rule from the central courts. Now, although uh, younger Yu had promised, you know, decades ago that he would continue the age-old tradition of, um, you know, succession by merit and, um, and uh, abdication to capable candidates. And of course, he did uh, name uh, Gao Yao and later Gao Yao San's Bo Yi as his successor. But uh, in his later years, after all his accomplishments and all his maneuvering and his um, conquest, he began to have different ideas, you know, in, in his later years. I mean, the consolidation of all these powers and authorities in his hands and in the hands of the central court basically meant that, you know, he had less and less need to appease and placate the regional chiefs. You know, his own power base and his own military might also ensured that he had the ability to crush any dissenting tribes, you know, if they were to raise up against him on their own. Um, and of course, you know, he fought so hard to stabilize the throne. He fought so hard to consolidate the authority and power. And any person, I guess, will start to have the idea like, you know, I worked so hard and fought so hard for all this. Um, why would I want to give it all up to someone else instead of, you know, just passing it down within the family to my own son? Now, we also know that Bo Yi, the name successor of Yu, was a highly regarded person in the realm. He had established his own reputation since the day, you know, under the reign of Shun. And although he was son of Gao Yao and he could very easily write on his father's reputation and coattails, uh, he made many contributions to society in his own right. And not the least, of course, was what we mentioned, the discovery of underground water and the development of the well system. Now, when Shun wanted to expand the livable land for the people, Bo Yi also devised a system of uh, fire fellow cultivation to clear out large expenses of agricultural land for the people with, uh, in relatively short times. And when Yu was fighting the floods, uh, Bo Yi, together with his father Gao Yao, were Yu's closest and most important assistants on the missions. And Bo Yi even found like, you know, time to make records of the various uh, geography, the flora and the fauna of the regions that they visited uh, in the flood fighting missions, in the flood fighting efforts. And these records were later proved uh, to be valuable. Uh, and became much of the source material for the Shan Hai Jing or classics of mountains and seas, which was written more than a thousand years later. Now, in the dealings with the Miao people before their submissions, uh, Bo Yi also displayed his foresight by reminding both Shun and Yu that, you know, forced integration through military might is you know, definitely not enough and not, uh, not sufficient. They should actually think about influencing the Miao people through education and virtues and, you know, basically what we call today soft power so that the Miao people will want to integrate and assimilate into the Huaxia uh, on their own. So this is a guy that basically, you know, in his own right, even without his father's reputation, would be, a uh, you know, pretty mighty fella, you know, a person that is really highly respected and worthy of their respect and his reputation. Now, all of these contributions to the people and the society um, made him basically a hero in the common man's eyes. His stellar reputation by this time was only second to the king, to Yu himself. And that reputation and the fact that he actually named him as an official successor to the throne um, made it very difficult for Yu to you know now change his mind and want to pass the throne down to his own son. 
um, if you was to do that, it would no doubt upset the leaders and upset the public. And so he has a tricky situation on his hands now. So after much thought and much uh, ruminating, he remembered that there were two important factors that ensured the smooth transition of power uh, from Shun to himself. First, he had already built and established a reputation for his, contri for his contribution in the flood fighting efforts. And secondly, when Shun named him as successor, uh, Shun basically you know, left the running of the realm to him and let him build his own reputation and experience as an administrator and as a ruler. So he felt that, yeah, maybe I can just do the same thing and try to build my son's reputation up and give him the experience that he needs. So what he did was that he pass on many of the responsibilities of running the realm, the administrative tasks and the governing of the land. He passed a lot of these responsibilities to his son Qi. While at the same time, he shrewdly limited the opportunities Bo Yi had of attaining any more uh, accomplishments or any more achievements. Uh, basically, he put Bo Yi into a kind of a semi-retirement while you know building Qi up as like the great beacon of hope for the future, uh, in the hope that you know the reputation of Qi would sl slowly outshine the memory of Bo Yi over time, and you know unsurprisingly this uh, ploy actually worked, and people actually really slowly forgot about Bo Yi and his contributions while Qi's. Uh, reputations uh, really grew among the people. He was known as a hardworking and diligent ruler and an administrator of the land. So by the time King Yu passed away, uh, he started wielding the powers of state just like he was a legitimate successor to the throne and most of the regional chiefs actually swore allegiance to him and no one really opposed to Qi wielding the powers of states. Now, seeing how the events unfolded, Bo Yi rightfully felt that he was robbed of his right and his claim to the throne, and so he returned to his homeland in the Tong Yi tribes and raised an army to, you know, reclaim the throne by force if he had to, you know, the throne that he felt rightfully belonged to him. Now, Qi, of course, was well prepared for Bo Yi's attempt to, you know, uh, make a power grab and by this time, he had consolidated his power base, he had years to build up his own power base, and now that many of the regional chiefs has already sworn allegiance to him, and of course with the original military might of the central court, I mean, Bo Yi and the Tong Yi rebellion was really nothing more than a fly buzzing around causing a nuisance, and all Qi had to do was just to swat him out of the way. So. Basically, <laughs> you know, Bo Yi's rebellion was crushed with uh, hardly even a fight, if you could even call it that. And so after the battle and after crushing Bo Yi and that feeble rebellion thing, you know, uh, she organized a feast to celebrate the victory and it was held in today's uh, Henan region. And during the feast, she openly declared the establishment of the Xia dynasty, named after his own tribe, uh, the Xia Ho tribe. So he named the dynasty Xia after the tribe. And he would install himself as the king and undisputed ruler of the land. Now, along with the establishment of a dynasty and his uh, proclamation of being the undisputed ruler over the land, uh, along with this, there were some major changes. The, the ascension of Qi officially cast aside the system of uh, leadership by consensus, where you know the, the regional leaders would have a say in you know nominating and electing who the next ruler or the next confederated chief is. Uh, it was done away with. Instead, now you have the undisputed ruler, the overall king of the land. And um, Succession was now dynastic and hereditary, which means you know the throne would now be passed on within the family or at least within the clan. 
And um, the tribal hierarchy that has worked for thousands of years before this was replaced by a unified and central government, uh, effectively converting the entire land into a feudal state of uh, slave owners. So instead of being tribal chiefs, now they are nobles in the new system, in the new normal. And all of them, instead of identifying themselves as, oh, I'm from this state, I'm from, that, I'm from this tribe, I'm from that clan. Uh, instead of that, now everyone will identify themselves as one single unified state or kingdom. Now, of course, many of the chiefs and the leaders were, you know, reluctant and not really keen on the idea, but what can they do? I mean, this guy just swat away a rebellion and a power grab like it was nothing. And everyone knew that the military power and the might of the central court and the political capital that the central court wielded was more than what anyone could, you know, even dream of overcoming. So as much as they were not keen on the idea, um, they have to silently accept that change is unavoidable and the days of whatever autonomy that they enjoyed uh, was effectively over. Now, although Chi was not as talented or enjoyed as much fame as his forebears or his father uh, Yu, uh, he was known, at this time, he was known as a hardworking ruler who held himself to extremely strict standards and you know, there were stories that say he only ate simple fare that uh, compared poorly even to the foods that some peasants ate. And he slept in old buildings made from rough materials and he, you know, uh, rejects all uh, luxury and he would not even sleep on silks. And he abstained, abstained from all forms of music and entertainment outside of uh, official rituals and ceremonies. And he was also known, well known in fact, for being you know, respectful and humble towards the elderly and he was very nurturing of the young. And you know, it was said that he had a good eye for talent and he made many good uh, appointments to positions in government. Now, all these character traits and all this um, reputation that he has built up over the years as basically his father's second in command and the administrator of the land, well, let's put it this way. These are very good stories and propaganda. And we will find out, you know, how this was all just a facade in future episodes. However, at this point in time, these uh, reputation and these uh, well-publicized character traits um, uh, worked in his favor and quickly endeared him to the populace. And barely a year into his reign, uh, the people fully recognized him as the rightful king of the land and you know, basically no one cast any doubt or questioned his legitimacy anymore. Now, this uh, transition from a uh, tribal society into a slave-owning feudal system was actually an era-defining event. The massive increase in productivity you know, under the feudal system greatly improved the standard of living. And the further specialization under the feudal system of this uh, agricultural and craftsmanship and craft work, it established a much higher baseline for economical growth. And thus, it provided an extremely strong foundation for the flourishing of culture and civilization. Of course, you know, once you do not really have to worry about uh, feeding yourself and when the next meal is going to come from, you of course have more time to think about, you know, making your life better, making things more enjoyable and making things of a higher quality, which is an uh, unchanging rule from thousands of years ago until today. Creativity only flourishes when society is stable and is flourishing as well. So, this transition from a tribal system to a feudal system uh, effectively gave a great boost uh, to productivity and the flourishing of uh, culture and civilization of the time. However, the thing is, yes, the Xia dynasty, although it was known for the transition between tribal to feudal, 
it was not really a very stable dynasty. In fact, we will find out in the next few episodes that this transition, the way that she took power, will actually plant the seeds of chaos for generations and generations down the road. And if you don't want to miss that, remember, subscribe to the channel, click on the bell icon to be updated when a new video drops. Now, I hope you enjoyed the story and the video. And if you did, please remember to smash the like, sub and bell icons. And uh, that would really help the channel out a lot. And if you would like to connect with me and if you have anything to say, any questions you want to ask, leave your comments in the comment section below. Or you can connect with me on other social media platforms or support the channel on Patreon through all the links in the description box as well. And I guess that's all for today. And I really, really, really hope you don't miss the next episode. And I'll see you soon.